You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Downloadable audio episodes can be found in the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. We are locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie, and today we are welcoming slash preparing to learn from Brianne Hennessy, owner of Your Vocal Vitality. And I'm excited because it's a podcast and we chat a lot. Yep. So, Brianne, <laughs> let's start with what is Your Vocal Vitality? It is the business that I started with the mission of empowering our voices. Ah. And what that means is, to me is that our voices are an expression of who we are, but also, I believe, a conduit to our well-being. And what do I mean by that? If you don't have your voice, you can't do what you need to do effectively. Interesting. And so that's the, the idea behind it, and I go about that in a few different ways. All right. And you've been in this industry for a while? Yes. So my background is actually as a speech and voice pathologist, and I've done that uh, 14 years. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that was that was the kind of core uh, crux of my training and my specialty and really digging into knowing all things about voice. And then that really opened up the possibility for me to fill in the gaps that I saw, shall we say, for where I could serve people in a greater way. All right. Yeah. So you work, and I imagine, for some corporate giant. I uh, used to, yes, right. yes. So a couple of the, the places I've been fortunate enough to learn from was Emory Voice Center in Atlanta. I was then at Vanderbilt Voice Clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And most recently, I was at UW Voice and Swallow Clinic just down the street in Madison. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So what made you make the jump from there? Mm. You know, the biweekly paycheck, the paid vacation, yes. whatever. <laughs> the things <True. laughs> to starting off on your own. In the day to day, my favorite thing was sitting in front of that person in the room and being able to interact with them in their voice. All right. Anything outside of that started to become very heavy. And that could be anything from the responsibility load that was increasing. Uh, for those of you in healthcare, you know that that is continuing to be a, a challenging time for folks. Plus, I saw this continual gap between folks who would come in and say, oh, I don't know what's going on with my voice. I've been able to talk for X number of years. Why now? I never heard of this before. I didn't know I could take care of my voice before something goes wrong. And that gap never really closed. And so I saw this opportunity to be preventative, to right. be proactive. And for most things in healthcare, we talk about preventative wellness, but I don't always see the follow through with that. No, not at all. No. Not at all. Because I think we'd be told to exercise more and eat better. Yeah. But we Let's are now say are now told I should say here's a pill. Yes. <laughs> Who wants the quick fix? Go Who, away. Yes, yeah. yes. How can I make this go away quickly enough? Uh, and I think there's there's a bigger holistic approach we could take. Totally understand. Yeah. Yeah. So when I met you, I remember thinking, wait, what do you do? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I understand if you want to be healthy, right? Quote yeah. unquote exercise, eat well, mm -hmm. but making your voice healthy, mm -hmm. that never dawned on me, uh, what do you do? Like I'm trying to think you do barbells on your vocal cords <laughs> or something. How, do you, right. how right. do you take care of your voice? The, the crux of it does come down a lot to exercises. There okay. are actual exercises and most people think of, for example, well it must be only for singing. But my focus is really the speaking voice. You and I spend the majority of our time speaking, as do many professions. Arguably and too much, right? Sometimes. I'm admittedly, told. I'm a talker. <laughs> <laughs> I'll own it. And so that is something that we can look at and say, if you're speaking for an extensive period of time and your voice starts to crack, starts to sound hoarse, you can't get through a work day, let alone a work week, there has to be something more we can do. And exercise is a great start. But the other piece of that is exercises alone aren't enough. For example, if anyone listening has ever had the experience of speaking out, sharing your opinion, asserting yourself, leading a group or, or a show, and not feeling heard, mm. that can take an emotional toll as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it comes into both sides of the voice. If you are physically overdoing it too much, too loud, too often, you're going to feel that, whether you're a sports coach, a teacher in the classroom, sales on the phone, whatever the case may be. But on the flip side, I've even had clients who don't feel heard at their own dinner table with their families. 
And is this because of their voice or their tone? Ultimately, or? yeah, good question. It can come across that way. I believe the voice is a barometer, so it's going to give those little signals that something underlying is, is probably the culprit. It can be how they believe about themselves and whether they think they're worthy to be heard. And oh. that's the biggest thing that I started to see over the years, self-worth or a lack of self-worth was actually being expressed through their voice. So you add that to the stresses of the day, uh, how much you have to talk, and that can all culminate as risk factors for the voice starting to have issues. Interesting. Yeah. So it goes well beyond just how are your vocal cords. Yes, but to your question about tone, that's the first thing most of us humans perceive. Mm -hmm. What is someone's tone? What is it telling us? It's going to give a lot of clues. And there are times where the tone of voice can be misunderstood. I spent <laughs> The first 32 years of my life being misunderstood for my tone of voice and 32 years oh yeah that seems like a while it was it it was was it monotone it was. was it high were you super was, low I don't know yeah no great question there there are folks that, that do experience that and kind of get stuck like in a, a certain type of voice think of mine was more I would say something and express myself and it would come across as maybe too harsh oh. or too irritable, too frustrated, whatever the person perceived it as. And internally, I'm thinking, I'm just trying to share. I'm just trying to express myself. Right. But there was this disconnect between me believing in what I was saying truly and trusting what I was saying oh. and how my voice was conveying that. And so when people didn't perceive me as hearing kind of what I was trying to say, that would start to create these like miscommunications these oh. difficulties. Then you have tone of voice, like yes, we all know folks who are either monotone, they just don't have a lot of variation in their voice. Sometimes that is from other issues, but often they just don't feel comfortable being outside of this little box where they kind of hover here. Yeah, you they typically kind of see shy. It tends to be with some personality yeah. characteristics. Then you have types of voices that can sometimes grind on the ear a little bit. For example, if we pulled a Kardashian voice right now, oh. this is kind of where people live. <laughs> if they live here for too long, that also can reduce your impact. You mm -hmm. can't project your voice in that mode. And then we have the times where if someone is going into, let's say, projected voice, we all know someone who walks in the room and you know they're there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a beautiful thing to be able to have that physical capacity, but it also means you're going 110% all of the time. And no body or body system can sustain that. I might be a little guilty here. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, so sorry. interesting, right? Like you can just start to kind of take inventory of like, what do I do with my voice? Where do I overdo it? It's a very powerful and resilient instrument. It's just not invincible. Which Fair. I think a lot of people mistake. Yeah, it's one of those things where you just assume. I imagine it's like eyesight. You're talking to yeah. a guy that I was just in the urgent care because mm. I use a circular saw without safety glasses. Oh, geez. Like a moron, right? It's <laughs> dumb. I've done right. it hundreds of times before. Right. And if it was ever an issue, you just kind of rub it and just deal with it for, mm -hmm. and a few minutes later, you're fine. Yeah. This time I wasn't fine. Oh. And I remember sitting in oh, the no. urgent care thinking, I wanted to save time. Ah. Uh, uh, the like, safety glasses where I had to look for them, right? So mm -hmm. I just got to make this cut quick, right. no big thing. Right. And now, I mean, urgent care for whatever reason is a half hour away. Yeah. So it took, I don't know, three hours dinking around. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm like, that was more time than if I would have just grabbed the safety glasses. Absolutely. But isn't that funny how, yes, as humans, we live, you know, usually by the mistakes we make, but there's mm -hmm. also so much to be said for. What do we want to prioritize for the things that are important to us, right. like our eyesight and like our voice? It's, a, it's the same thing. Folks come in and say to me, but I've screamed at my kids' games before, or I'll go to the football match and shout and cheer, or the concert, and my voice is fine the next day until it wasn't. Right. And then they're three days into work, a week into work, two weeks later, and something's still not right, and it's already starting to impact their productivity, their communication, uh. and physically, they don't feel well. It's okay. not them anymore. It's not wow. their voice. Yeah. You know, so when I'm sitting at my kid's soccer game yeah. and the parents around me are screaming yeah. at the kids, it's yeah. always, my kid and I always joke about it after the game because yeah. the parents are yelling something like, shoot it. <laughs> like the kid's going to be like, good thought. Yeah, exactly. So I can just tell them, hey, you haven't warmed up your voice yet. Yeah. So maybe just don't say anything this game. Yeah. And then next game when I'm not here, you can talk all you want. 
Uh, I think that's totally reasonable. Folks don't even think twice about it yeah. for, for the most part. I'm a big fan of anything non-vocal. So if you're the parent with the cowbell or the maracas <laughs> or whatever you want to choose, <laughs> it's a great way <laughs> to preserve your voice. And it doesn't mean you can't express yourself that way. Not at all. This is a what's best for your instrument. Have you warmed up and prepared it? Mm -hmm. And do you know your signs if it does start to, to feel a little tweaked? So like if someone's shouting and they think, oh, whoops, I felt the scratch, but they keep powering through and shouting, mm -hmm. it was probably the sign that, All they, right. that they were headed in the wrong direction. So I can remember being at a concert. Yeah. Uh, well, just about any concert I've been to when I don't know if I'm singing along or screaming woo right. or whatever, but the next morning you wake up and you're like, oh. Pretty, like this. That's, that's not right. No, yep, not right at all. And, and we are inherent healers. I believe we can heal ourselves, and yet if the voice, the rule of thumb typically, if the voice has not resolved itself within two weeks, okay. that needs to be looked at by Two a weeks, that seems like a long time. Okay. It is a long time, especially for those who are voice professionals who are like, wait, nope, I need, I need it now. Yeah, how about now? Uh, and, and then we get into this sense of, okay, but I'll just, I'll just keep talking. That'll warm up my voice. It usually puts more pressure on it when there's already a sign that there's an injury. So there are things that can be done to triage it. I do help folks kind of triage through those acute times, but it really comes down to, all right, what steps are you going to take so that this doesn't happen again? All right. And if it does, how can you reduce that time? So it's not two weeks and <laughs> you're not putting yourself at long-term injury. So what are you having people do? Is it something as simple as calling them on the phone and saying, hey, I have no idea. I don't yeah. know. Gargle salt water? I have no yeah. idea. No, great. That is that is great for some colds <laughs> and, and, and some so laryngitis type symptoms. This is, I prefer um, more interactive work when possible. Of course, in person is my favorite. Virtual is what, you know, most of my business ended up going into. Yeah. As we all, <laughs> a I'm, lot of us had to the last three years. It's funny. I'm but, totally ignorant of this. Yeah. So I'm super interested. Yeah. It's just like, what do you do? Yeah. We, I actually take people through ways to look at how they're using their voice. Like your examples are perfect. If you go through your week and you're like, what do I do with my voice every day? And then there are actual exercises. It can be anything from, some people have heard of things like humming or doing a lip trill, for example. So if I was to do something like brrrr, All right. that can help warm up a voice. Can it now, really? Oh yeah. Yeah, oh. in certain doses, in certain ways that are feeling really easy and good for the person. Things like humming in the shower, really good on the voice. Oh. Things like belting aloud to every song in the car on a road trip, not so great for the voice. But <laughs> well, I'm doing it all wrong, okay. <laughs> but it's not, again, to take anything away. It's more just to notice like, ooh, how much am I doing and when and have I overdone it? Um, so those are some of the kind of technical exercises. But the other things really come down to, are you aware of your body? Are you aware of your breath? Are you speaking in a way that actually feels good to you? Or by the end of the day, are you exhausted? And it's because of the way you're talking. How, so that last one, how do you know that? Ah, good question. Most people describe it as a fatigue or a pain or a soreness here. Okay. So they'll say, oh my gosh, I just feel like I can't get another word out. I didn't even want to read to my kids tonight at bed. And they just feel an ache, sometimes physical ache. Sometimes they feel an overall just sense of drained and exhaustion. And other times, like when you wake up in the morning after that concert, if you go to talk and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm having a really push to get my voice out, mm -hmm. those are some of the common signs. Interesting. Yeah. So what is happening physically mm -hmm. in your mm -hmm. larynx, throat, larynx, whatever? Larynx, yes, okay. exactly. If you put your hand here mm -hmm. and then you make a sound, hum, whatever the case may be, yeah. especially at your Adam's apple, go up a little higher, okay. you're going to feel vibrations. That's totally. normal. Yep. The okay. vocal folds are coming together and vibrating. So what's physically happening is our larynx is the housing. The vocal folds are like a little V. They just sit this way okay. in the throat. And as right now, you're breathing, James, so they're just open. Mine are moving and vibrating because I'm talking. And so that's happening because the breath is coming up through the vocal folds, making them vibrate very fast. We're talking anywhere from 100 times a second up to if a high soprano sang a high note at 1,000 times a second. A second? A second. Holy cow. Yep. Okay. It's so, bees wings type speed. Yes, exactly. So this is where we perceive things like pitch, like a low pitch and a high pitch and all the things in between. That has to do with that rate of vibration. So then it's one thing to say, okay, I've got my breath. I've got my breath going through the vocal folds. But what happens if we don't have anything else? It would just sound like a buzz. We need to have it resonate or travel through the spaces of our head and neck. Mm -hmm. So you put that on and that's why you sound like you and I sound like me, and we each can have our own unique sound. 
because we actually have a f space, a filter, to pass that sound through. So it's like a toweling tube or something like that? Yeah, okay. exactly. And so the exercises themselves, it's not necessarily always some specific exercise. It's what actually activates the optimal way for you to take that breath in the right amount, through the vocal folds in the right amount, and make sure that it's amplified through your face and nose and sinuses in a way that actually projects and feels good to you. All right. Yeah. So when you feel sore yeah. from talking too much, like mm -hmm. now that we're talking about this, I don't know if it's just because we're talking about it. It or happens. because I've been babbling <laughs> all day. Like, wait a second. Oh, wait, wait a second. That's, <laughs> that's not a good feeling. Yeah. Is the idea that you're, you're fatiguing? Mm -hmm. Essentially, you can think of it very loosely related to like a skeletal muscle fatigue that mm -hmm. you would experience at going to the gym or the end of a long day. The, the structures and the, the system of the voice is a little bit slightly different, however, very similar. The fatigue can happen to the muscles around, so we're supporting okay. our larynx here. This is like, think of it like a little suspension system. The larynx is just kind of dangling in the neck and supported by muscles out here. So you may even go, oh, oh, that's tender. Like you can actually feel it. Like you go to the massage therapist and they hit that sweet spot. It's kind of like that. So there's massages and things that can be done internally tissue can fatigue. So think of it like getting a blister on your foot. Okay. After a while, because of that friction, that's going to create a stress and strain that then the tissue is just like, oh, I can't. no, no. And usually when that happens, you're either going to feel it as a, as a scratchy feeling, you're going to feel it as a cutting in and out, or you'll start to notice that there's no more consistency to your quality. Usually when that happens, when we take a look with a scope, we can actually see that little changes to the tissue have happened, like a blister growing on the vocal folds, oh. or like a um, kind of a section of strained muscle, if you will. And that's when we need to say, whoa, here's the plan. We're going to try to reorient how you're using your sound. So that to me sounds like you're sticking a camera down someone's... I used to do that so every single day. That's every like, yeah. single day? Yep. Yep, I've probably scoped thousands of, of voices at this point. Holy mm -hmm. cow. Yeah, it's incredible. It's an incredible instrument. We can look with a scope through the mouth or through the nose. It's not as scary as you would think. Don't worry. Sounds I've walked on science I've fiction <laughs> freaky. Done it, I know. I've done it on, on everything from two year olds all the way up to 95 year olds. Wow. So, yeah, but it's fascinating because the important thing is this is an instrument that lives in the dark. Can you think of any other musician who can't see and take apart their instrument? No. Not but, many. Stevie Wonder? I don't know. Right. I mean, but even then, he plays piano. Right. right. He's singing, sure. But as far as vocalists go, from a speaking standpoint and singing standpoint, we don't see this instrument. And yet, if something's going wrong, we've got to be able to look at the physical structure and be able to see the vocal folds vibrate, which we can do. It's pretty All cool. Right. We use a special light called a stroboscopy light, the short term, strobe. So yes, like a party on the dance floor, you got your strobe light going. Right. What happens when you see the dancer on the floor, right? They look like right. they're going in slow motion. It's the same idea with the vocal folds because remember how fast I said they vibrate? Mm -hmm. You can't see that with the naked eye. Oh, so interesting. all it looks like is fuzzy until okay. you get the strobe light in there and then you can see the detail. And it's it's like really a cool. Timing light on a car. Correct. Okay. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. So let's just say you stick that camera down there yeah. and you see some bad stuff. Yeah. What do you do? How do you fix it? At that point, I, ideally, you are already with a specialist. Uh, I'm a big fan of specialty in this case because this is not an everyday, you know, primary care physician kind of issue. This is this is a specialty where folks like speech language pathologists who have specialized in voice, ENTs who have specialized in voice, know the refined detail and latest research. So when we look down and we say, oh something's going wrong, there's already a physical change, there's a lump, bump, lesion, et cetera. We can create a treatment plan that usually looks something like voice therapy. That is the best way to start getting the voice to work as its optimal way. There is often a indication for maybe some lifestyle changes. Maybe it's how much you're talking. Maybe it's things like allergies, sinus stuff, reflux, acid, all of this. And then the final thing is meeting with the laryngologist. That basically means an ENT, ear, nose, and throat doctor, who spent an extra year specializing in voice. Wow. And similarly, when that laryngologist has a team, like I worked on with a speech and voice pathologist, someone who trained as a speech pathologist but took an extra year to learn voice, you are literally getting a comprehensive approach to something that otherwise I've seen many times go untreated and get worse for people if they weren't headed in the right direction. Interesting. So okay. it's really cool because 
between conservative things like voice therapy and lifestyle management, you are much more likely to avoid voice surgery. There are some, some instances that people need to have surgery on their voices and, and ultimately that much more prepared to have longevity. Talking. You know, my dad yeah. uh, had surgery on his voice Did after he? a stroke. Yeah. Wow. He uh, so he had a stroke uh, two years ago, roughly. Okay. I remember it was during pandemic because yeah. we couldn't see him in the hospital. Oh. So that's <laughs> that's how you know. That's how yeah. <laughs> uh, but he so when he got out of the hospital, he had yeah. a very high pitched voice. Did he? Oh it my was gosh. it was surreal. Not to the point of helium. Yeah. But it sounded like somebody was trying to sound like a little girl. Yeah. And I bet that was really frustrating. For yeah. Him. So yeah. he he had surgery. Wow. And I was better, but it's not not the same voice. Especially when something like neurologic happens mm -hmm. to it as well. Let alone, yeah, not not being who you remember him sounding. Like. Yeah. Yeah. It was bizarre. Yeah. He went through a lot of changes, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Strokes. Physically and whatever. Yeah. That's still, yeah. don't have a stroke. <laughs> I know, <laughs> not right? Know. Speaking of preventative care. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's other ways to to prevent that too. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it's interesting because yeah. in that case or in uh, surgery on yeah. the voice, what yeah. are they doing? Depends solely on what the diagnosis is. So, for example, some people who may have a lump or bump, they need that removed. Other people are not getting their voice, their vocal folds to close completely, so they are having a lot of air escape. Oh. So they need help stenting it or bringing them closer. For okay. example. Other folks uh, that I worked with ultimately would present with laryngeal cancers and actually have their entire voice box removed. Whoa! Yeah, and so we help them in different ways to restore a sound, a, an ability to make some sound and, and speak again, but it can really run the gamut. And so it was, I think, most fascinating in that gap I talked about, about preventative care, people would say, well, maybe it started six months ago, a year ago. And by that time, for example, when you think of a blister, if you let a blister just go, like it could just get worse and worse and yeah. worse. It's similar with this. Some of those impact lesions, those lesions that come from lots of impact and stress, if they get worse over time, it's going to be harder to remedy with therapy, harder to remedy just with conservative measures. So. I always thought it was great for the, the really excellent surgeons that I worked with. Surgeons don't want to do surgery, you realize. Oh. They get into surgery because, yes, not they are realize that. talented at this. <laughs> but the surgeons don't want to get to that point if they don't have to. They want people to make those lifestyle and behavioral changes. They want it to be a quicker recovery time. Voice surgery means you have to be on voice rest completely, no talking, for minimum three days, sometimes up to seven days. Wow. I don't know any, including myself. If you want to try to experiment that with yourself this afternoon, yeah, like, right? can I not say a word? It's tough. It's a, it, it impacts your quality of life. It's, yes, something that is temporary, but it, it really is a lot to ask. Like your virgin care visit, mm -hmm. like, man, can I afford, <laughs> afford a surgery, afford to lose that much time of work, afford to shift my way of being? Yeah. If I'm only. just thinking about no singing in the car. That's right. No complaining about traffic. No. Nope. No communicating with your kid. No. No. Now some things you might want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no telling the the parents behind me at my kid's soccer game that um, they're ruining their they're, voice. Yeah, exactly. They should be quiet. Right? <laughs> you just become someone with a sign. A yeah. Right. Shut You're like, it. here's what it is. And that's and and honestly, there are some times where that becomes kind of a useful temporary measure for folks, but ultimately. Again, the, the surgeons are there to make sure that the whole person is treated and uh, the reason that they enjoy and excel at being surgeons is because when you do have surgery, especially with the folks who are at the UW Voice Clinic, they are pristine. All right. You don't want to be with just like Bob's pretty good surgeon down the road. No. <laughs> Bob's pretty that's, good surgeon. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, oh, it's remarkable kind of the differences in, and I get it. Everybody has, I think, choices in most cases with healthcare, but I think there's something to be said for second opinions, for ensuring you're in the right place. Totally. Um, a lot of times we get asked often, especially when I worked in Nashville, uh, which is also known as Music City, so a lot of different types of, of folks would come in who do have singing careers. One of the things that gets heard of a lot are those horror stories, right? Things like, I had surgery, but they left me with scar. Oh. Scar does not sound like yourself anymore. The vocal folds need to be pliable and loose. 
Um, I had surgery, but my range is gone. I had surgery, but I can't talk as long as I need to. So there are still practitioners out there that are not on the most up-to-date oh, procedures. Interesting. So okay. that's also part of my, my work. I love answering folks' questions to be able to say, where do you live? Who can I send you to? Because I want you to just do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go straight to like yeah. the source. You know? All right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So in your business, yeah. who are the people that you are typically helping? Are they typically, yeah. I mean, you go towards like singers or uh, podcasters, I don't know, people yeah. that are jabbering too much? Yeah, well, it, for the most part, it's, it's really fascinating because once people start to consider how can I be proactive about my voice, the, a lot of folks that I've seen are entrepreneurs, usually ones who have a podcast, who are needing to coach their clients, who are leading their teams, so they are talking a lot, who are speaking on stage. So I focus in on the speaking voice, but then there are folks who are educators. I have a big heart oh. for teachers, and teachers are one of the most at-risk populations for a voice change. They're talking all day. All day, and then expected to go home and talk some more usually. And it's it's challenging in an, in an environment where there's maybe not the best acoustics. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is you know harder to command classrooms. Um, and teachers can really have a struggle once they start to, to have changes to their voice. There can also be folks who are wanting to feel more confident, speak up more, and so those are the type of folks I work with as well. All right. So singing comes into it in some of the exercises we do because I think it's fun, and I think everyone can sing for the joy of it regardless of how it sounds. Fair. And it's, it's not my primary focus as far as like, if you're a singer, I will direct you to some of the wonderful singing and voice instructors that I know. Mm -hmm. However, I want people to really look at their voice as a tool and a thing that they can love. All right. Yeah. So when somebody comes to you, are they typically coming to you because they have a problem? Mm. Or they want, they're want they aware, they're smart enough, smarter yeah. than me, <laughs> and want to fix it before it's broken kind of thing? A little bit of both. Usually, though, they've already kind of veered into noticing things like my voice cuts out when I get nervous or I have this big presentation coming up. What am I going to do? And they want to be more proactive. But for the most part, in the, especially in the last couple years, I've been able to really shift it to where folks know to come to me on the early stages. All right. So maybe they've started noticing, but only because, like you just did, like, wait, oh, that does sound like me, or actually, I could notice some of those symptoms sometimes. And and that's what I think is really cool about it, because then we can always say, what's possible to improve? Right. How can I look at this in a way that there's nothing wrong with me, there's nothing I have to fix, but could this be better? I have a gentleman I'm working with right now, and he was already very mindful of, well, if my body ages and I want to mitigate aging, what if I could mitigate my voice aging, which you can. Oh. So that's kind of some of the things we're working on. All right. So, yeah. You mentioned something about voice shaking yeah. when people are nervous. Yes. I was just at a presentation last week, and a person was talking, and they were talking yeah. about their business. And, I mean, it was a small room. We're talking 12 people, 10 people, whatever. Right. Small crowd. Right. And you could hear shaking in their voice. Yeah. And I thought, huh, I wonder if you could train that out of there. Mm. Or is that more of a mental thing rather than a physical voice thing? It could be both. So... Because of my background, one of the populations that I used to work with a lot is actually folks who ended up having voice tremor. So that okay. is something that is neurologic, meaning just the same way someone could have a stroke, someone could uh, experience ALS, someone could experience MS, voice tremor is something they can't help. It's oh. a neurologic thing. So the voice will start shaking now. Typically, we tend to perceive this as the old age voice yeah. because it tends to show up in the later decades. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always mindful of that when I hear someone shaking to listen for, is this truly nervousness? Is this truly something that they're dealing with um, from, from their presentation skills? Or is it something that they can't help? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, yes, it can be that they are nervous, that they don't know what they want to say, or they don't like being in front of crowds. But there are ways to train people through that. And it's really cool because a lot of times folks, again, want to go to the quick fix of, I have a presentation tomorrow. What can I do right now? It's like, well, <laughs> that's a little, Tell me five a little years short. Ago. <laughs> yeah, that's a little short notice. Because think of how when we train our body, any athlete is mm -hmm. going to look, you know, six weeks, six months in advance. They're not going to expect their body or their nervous system to change overnight. Right. Now, Anything is possible, and some people are quick learners. But remember, when we're trying to habitualize a new skill, it's something that we've got to get the whole body on board with. It's not just enough to be like, 
I'm going to power through and I'm not going to shake and I'm not going to sound nervous. That also doesn't convey usually the energy they're trying to. Mm -hmm. So it can go both ways. So when you're coaching someone on that, yeah. do you touch on the, I don't know, I guess in this case, confidence yes. or yes. something and of that nature? Yes. And usually that comes to what do they believe about themselves? Like how do they perceive themselves as a speaker? How do they want to be perceived? What historically have they experienced? Most of the time there's some experience, whether it's initially singing, oh, I was told when I was in fifth grade that I wasn't a good singer. Like, t mm -hmm. wow. people say, you, you know, we run into all sorts of different, different messages growing up, but people say some really harsh things about, and people internalize that. Then we have things like people not even liking the sound of their own voice, so they don't want to speak. I, you know, it's interesting you say that. Yeah. Because I just had an employee with call answering service. Yeah. We have a new client. Yeah. And I said, hey, employee, yeah. uh, we need a few recordings yeah. for this client, the voicemail recording. Right. The on hold, we have a little thing where we just babble. It's essentially just instead of ringing or dead air or elevator music. Right. It's just something to entertain the person on hold. Yeah. Stuff like that. And she, it took her two, two or three days to put together these. We're talking... I mean, a voicemail message is like, hey, you know, seconds, you reach yeah. this company, leave <laughs> right. a message, you know what to do kind of thing. Right. And I bugged her a little bit. I'm like, why? Yeah. What, what is the challenge here? Yeah. Because I gave you time to be off the of phones right. to do this. So right. it should have been knocked out. Five minutes. Right. Could have knocked it out. And she said that. She said, I mm. hate the sound of my voice. Can you imagine, James, though? Like that, that is like waking up every day in the mirror and looking at yourself and saying, I hate this. It was so bizarre to me because yeah. I think she's got an incredible voice. That's, that's why I hired her. That's the thing though, right? Exactly. Well, how we perceive ourselves is usually very different than how other people perceive us. Okay, and that's true. And when it comes Fair. to voice, most people, because you're hearing yourself through bone in your ears and the air, hear something on recording, which is only through the air, mm -hmm. and they are like jarred. It's like, that's not me. I don't know what that is. Uh -huh. And they haven't had as much experience hearing themselves as the way you're hearing them. Okay. So, yes, we have bias to what types of voices we like and all that, which is fine to a point. But also, for a person to be that reticent to share her voice because she internally is not liking it, mm -hmm. I find that that's going to actually show up in the message and the energy of what she's recording there, and what she's doing. So, fair. Totally fair. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because yeah. in the recording, yeah. uh, it was, I would say, 90% perfect. Uh -huh. But there was a little hiccup. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I thought was, it's totally a confidence thing. Yeah. Totally a confidence thing. Yeah. Which, on my, <laughs> from my point of view, I'm like, you're smart, mm -hmm. you have a cool voice, and you're in a smart, cool voice business. Right. So you have all the skills, right. so it should be no confidence issue. You're, you're like a marathoner that's going to a, whatever, a 5K. This right. is no problem. And yet, what it's perception and backstory, that's right, does she bring to the table? I don't. I didn't know how far, to, how yeah. deep to go with that, and, and I was that's like, "Okay." And it's not something you know. Most people feel either comfortable with, or even that person is willing to address. They have to be ready, right? To say, yeah. "Wait a second, there's something underlying this." And then the cool thing about the work is that I encourage and help people feel comfortable in finding that natural voice, honoring it, listening to it, and doing things that they actually then enjoy about their voice. Right. But it's. Until they, they choose to make that, that change and that difference, it's them every day in a dissonant space. Okay. Right? They're, they're internally saying one thing, but their voice is expressing a different thing. So they're thinking, oh my gosh, I hate this sound. I can't believe I have to do this. Nobody's going to like this on playback. And then trying to put on a voice. Sure. But if that dissonance continues, that only increases that misperception, that internal hate. For okay. Their, for how they're saying Oh, that's strong. Oof. Yeah, <laughs> it is. When people say the word hate, that's a very strong word. Yeah. So I, I would cringe for them. to. It breaks my heart because when they say that, that is, again, a self-image piece that not many people think about. And yet it can be healed. It yeah. can be changed. All right. Yeah. And so that's what you help people with. Yeah. And is this uh, one and done? Like, hey, thanks for coming. You're all <laughs> fixed question. now. Yeah. <laughs> or is this uh, more like, hey, man, if you want to train for a marathon, you got to yeah. come to the gym more than once yeah. kind of thing? More like the latter. There usually is at least anywhere from, you know, six weeks to six months that people need. 
Why? Habits take time to, f to form. We know that even from the research. Habits are not a 21-day phenomenon, <laughs> no matter what we've been told. On average, habits can take anywhere from 66 days onward to form. And then that's with the frequency, how much they're willing to prioritize, the practice, and then just that initial, like getting over the hump of the awkwardness. I make people say silly sounds. Let's just be clear, right? Because well, we're well, gonna I mean, do a lot of different things. That's the business, That's right? the business. So just seeing people kind of be like, what is, what am I doing? Like getting comfortable with that, that matters. If your nervous system is like, mm -mm, no thank you, that's gonna be a lot harder learning curve, right? Than being like, okay, how can I baby step this? So for the most part, the people that I see the most success with are those who choose to dedicate anywhere from six weeks to six months. And that really comes down to when I speak with them, we kind of co-create what duration and what package looks best for them. Okay. Um, but life happens too, right? We have we have things where folks are like, oh, I have the holidays, oh, I have this vacation. So I like the flexibility of that too because like any athlete, we go back to, they're not gonna do conditioning for a season. Right. They're going to learn the skills and keep conditioning and yes, there may be ebbs and flows. Can we have maintenance periods? Can we have little reboots, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. But the sooner you begin to see yourself as a vocal athlete, the sooner you start to notice this is a way of being that I want to incorporate in my life, not just a, yep, check that off the box and on I go. Yeah, fixed voice. All right, yeah. we're all good. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that it's us working that intensively the whole time. My goal is for you to have that toolkit, that independence, but also that trust that you've learned your voice so well, you know what to do when. All right. I think that's really powerful for people. So a lot of this you do, or is it all, I guess you tell mm -hmm. me, is it uh, in person? Ideally, yes. Most of though, I will say um, my my business success initially came from folks online, virtually. Oh, it did? Okay. Mm -hmm. Because right. of the, the, the changes in the last three years and having to, to go online, uh, a lot of my clients have been, been online, and that was an adjustment for me, to be honest. I am one I who wants to, I need to hear the voice, I'm doing screenings, I need to feel, I like to feel and palpate things, what's going on, but also, I like I said, it's very holistic, so we're doing different movements and whole body kind of approach to it, but I'm excited now to get back to more in person. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I really wanna. So you have an office? Uh, I work from home right now, okay. and I usually go to the person's house. Oh, so, you do? Okay, mm -hmm. I was just gonna ask. Yep, so one of my most recent clients, she, it was great. We, I go to her house, she has this great space in, in her basement, and then we would be able to do all the different Okay. Different exercises. Yeah. So as far as equipment, is yeah. it just your mind or is it it's, microphone, yeah. <laughs> speakers, headphones kind of thing? Yeah, definitely grateful for my ears. It's a lot, lot of lot of the ears and then usually things like having having um, their homework, which usually I keep very digital now. Some things simply like a straw. Some of the exercises require a straw. A straw, mm -hmm. okay. Making sure there's what they're drinking something, there's gotta be some some liquid involved. But yeah, as far as tools, it's pretty minimalistic. All right. Yeah. Well, that's super cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's great. And so when you are helping someone remotely, yeah. do you ever find, I guess, now that I'm thinking about this, when they listen, yeah. it's going through their whole body, whatever. Right. And when you hear it like we are now, it's right. going through the air. Yep. But now you're introducing a microphone Tech. and speakers <laughs> yeah. and software and the internet servers, whatever, yeah. <laughs> compression. You're frozen. And, I can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All that stuff. <laughs> I've noticed it's gotten better. Some of the platforms have gotten better clearly over the last last couple of years by necessity. Uh, but yes, there is a consideration for when I hear something, I do little extra checks for now what I want to have them try, what I'm listening for. And sometimes I often just have people straight up record a voice memo for me. Oh. So our, our phones all have the voice memo app, which has been awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's a much, you know, clearer signal. But I, I've been really fortunate because the, the platforms I use have gotten much better in their, in right. their audio quality. Yeah. Um, but that's also with a lot of grace to both, I, again, I want the person to become familiar with what they're hearing. And if there's any concern at all, I'm always able to refer them to have that screening. Go see that laryngologist, go see that speech and voice pathologist in the clinic to get the scope because we want to make sure everything is A-OK -okay to begin with. Sure. So. That's easy enough to do, even on a phone screening without any any other tech. All right. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So you started your business. You got rid of the corporate stuff. You're on your own. What have been some of the biggest challenges that you've run into? I would say 
For me, because I love to learn, I uh, shiny object syndrome. Oh, actually, yes. Interesting. So okay. When when I first started, and I had a great mentor who was able to kind of show me the foundations of how to build a business and what that looked like, that was really helpful. And I kept looking then for the next thing and the next thing, and investing in this program and this mentor. And I've been really fortunate, on the whole, to have really great mentors and look at what I've implemented as successful. I can also look and say, huh, was I just learning for the sake of learning because I didn't trust oh. that what I was learning I could do? Okay. Or was it just that this was, you know, me hoping that this next thing would help me take that next leap, whatever that looked like? And I think it's a combination of both. Okay. I don't think people really talk enough about the fact that you can take all the learning in, but you have to be able to implement it and trust that what you've learned is enough. And remember one of the reasons I said that I started this is because to me, when our self-worth is intact, we're gonna be a whole different kind of level of performer. Absolutely. And so if that level of enoughness is messing with business investments, with you know implementation, it's very tempting to be like, well, it must be this next thing. I'll just buy this one more course. Oh. I'll just do this one more thing. And so that, that was my initial struggle. And so in the last year, I've really been able to let that go. I've really okay. been able to release that and say what I know is enough, what I'm able to implement is going to be the thing that I'm going to put the focus on. And that's been awesome. That's it's super really cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's helped me finally hone and finish my voice health course project, which I've been working on for years. When, and that felt alone, just like, oh my gosh, like this is complete. I can now get this out into the world. And so it's those kind of moments where that that struggle, I think, turned into more of a strength. All right. At this point. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So have you, do you have employees? That would be my second struggle. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of, of y'all other entrepreneurs out there have that, you know, how to build the best team kind of kind of situation, if, if you've ever experienced that. I, James, in your years of experience, I have no doubt. That is something that I am in the midst of a, a, a season of stretch, let's say. Okay. I have, I have been fortunate to um, employ two different assistants over the, the last four years. Um, and it's also time to look at, okay, what does it mean to, to get the right people in the right places and truly delegate? Mm-hmm. I like to think I can do it on myself. <laughs> oh, we all do to a point. Yeah, yeah. to a point. And so, because we, we want that vision to be, you know, come to fruition. But teams to me has been a, a big struggle, actually. I'm still kind of finding my way uh, through that. And it's a trust thing. It's a, it's a big trust thing for me to delegate, see it through, and be able to say, okay, someone's as invested, maybe not as invested as you know, yeah, right. we are in our own. <laughs> right. I get that. But also just being able to trust that it'll be there, you know, as a as a outlet for the long haul. Oh, you know? I don't I don't want to be a solo act. Okay. I want this to be a team approach. I want to have a support system in that way, and so that's it's it's in a it's in a changing season right now. All right. Yeah. And is the challenge finding the people, or knowing how to look for the people, or knowing where to look for the people? Both, all, because okay. in that there's so many, you know, levels of how far do you vet them, you know, mm -hmm. what do you, you can list out your lovely, you know, expectations and tasks, and then what? It's just so different than, like, when I was in my clinical role, mentoring students, leading fellows, so our fellows would come in, that was their first job, like that, I loved that. Oh, nice, I okay. loved that. This is very different, I feel like, which yeah. is fascinating. So. Some people could say, well, you're still leading. It's still, you know, you know, guiding people. And it's, it's different. There's, there's just totally a different, different feel. So, um, so I think right now, yeah, it's been finding, knowing where to look, finding the right people. And we, as the hiccups come throughout the time, how best to reorient. Okay. And how best to make sure that is what I'm asking reasonable? If yes, how do we streamline it? So I think that's been really, really fascinating for me to wonder, are my standards too high? Or is it no, that I'm not? Never, <laughs> never I, appreciate, too high. I appreciate you saying that. 
because I definitely, I crave that efficient, like streamlined team where everything's going, you know, and running smoothly. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, it's, it's a matter of, of really finding that person who's willing to, to put in the, the, the work for it. Right. So yeah. are these voice experienced people or nope. these are just people Not that want to work a computer kind yep. of thing? Exactly. Okay. exactly. I know how to copy and paste. I know what an email yes, is. Yes, exactly, like, okay. exactly. So. Yeah, I don't. In that case, yeah, I would dare say that your standards are not too high. Okay. <laughs> I feel like universally, just to get uh, on my little complainer soapbox, yeah, that a lot of employees or yeah. people that are looking for jobs, yeah, are going the route of the post office, mm. which is it costs more, but the service is lower. Mm. So, and I feel like there's universal compromise where people are just people, employers, are yeah. tolerating it to a point, but... Ah, rather than trying to raise the bar? Yeah, it's, yeah, it seems like we're circling the drain, like we're yeah. all, or a lot of the people that we see in the market, yeah. as far as employees are uh, just saying, accept it or go away. The interesting yeah. thing with uh, yeah. um, the interns yeah. is that they probably had a three-month, six-month internship, Right. or if they left that, right. that internship kind of goes with the school season, yeah, so if they left exactly. that internship... They can't find another one for another semester or whatever. Right. So there's an obligation to be there. Yeah. Where an employee, if they want to find a different job, they just quit this one and within a few hours they have another Go one. Go to another one. Yeah. yeah. So what, in your experience, how does, how does one craft the best team? Man, I don't have, I, I have an answer or answers, but okay. I'm nowhere near having that all yeah. figured out. It's a tough and spot. I would dare say that I've not met anyone that does. Yeah. Because if you go to if you go to just about any business, yeah. right, they're having the same issues or similar issues. Right. And a really quick uh, long story that I'll make into a short one. Yeah. I had a problem with an employee, yeah. different business that I had. Uh, they caused some headaches with some clients. Mm. So I reached out to the clients to try to do damage control. Yes. And the funny thing funny now <laughs> the funny <laughs> thing is able to laugh about it yes yeah the funny thing was that when i called those clients up and said hey um essentially it was i mean it was nicer than this but i said i had a garbage employee did some not so great things yeah. i gotta figure out what he did uh with your help to so i'll make it right right and what i got out of that almost every single phone call yeah. was stories that were worse than mine Oh, wow. So they're just like, oh, yeah, no problem. This is what he wow. said. This is what's going on. This is where we're left. And I'm like, okay, so I know how to make it right. Hmm. And they said, this is nothing. And then they would tell me some employee story. Wow. And my first thought was like, oh, that's cool, right? That's cool. But then my second thought was, wait, this gets worse? Right. Like, why are we going, <laughs> like you said, to the lowest common denominator? Yeah, yeah it was bizarre. Yeah. yeah. So, and I joke with employees or hmm. potential employees when I'm interviewing them. Yeah saying we're essentially on a first date and I may ask you to marry me yeah. after this first date. Yeah. And I talked to another guy that said he was on his 10th interview. And I'm like, 10th interview? Yeah. Who doesn't have a job by then somewhere else? The processes have become much more yeah, intensive. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because I'm like, eh, I, don't, I can't do 10 interviews because I don't, it just feels weird then. There, yes, I think there is a happy middle ground and I think it's important to make sure it's a good fit and that the skills are actually there. Yeah. I think that's the thing. It can be easy to inflate that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can totally do that. I'm a really good learner. I'll learn anything. And it's like, no, I need it done and now, yeah. <laughs> like already in the queue. So it's interesting to see where that disconnect maybe comes in for people. Because yeah. they, they if, especially if they are excited about it, and at the same time, I, yeah, it has to be an aligned fit. If it's yeah. not aligned, especially, especially when it comes to the mission and the values, but if it's not aligned with, you said you could do this task, but it's not getting done, then there's got to be some hard decisions. Yeah, I think <laughs> it comes down to or easy ones, right? Yeah, or, or maybe easy ones, yes. Difficult conversations, easy yeah. decisions. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. So we, um, so I guess to answer your question, yeah. I ask questions in interviews that are not typically asked. Ah, okay. You and try ahead. to get, uh, try to find their, or watch their reaction. Yeah. And it's not, a, there's no wrong answer. Of course. Like of one course. of the questions, for example, is what is something that you used to believe that you no longer believe? Ah, uh, cool. That's something like question. that where you can get them kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's not just like, what are your strengths or weaknesses kind yeah. of things that they practice that. Or yeah. they're like, I just work too hard. Right? That's my weakness. <laughs> something like that. Exactly. 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah those. Something just bizarre. So right. I ask questions like that right. to see how they react and try to learn about them as a person. That, yeah, that's a really good one. Well, there's no wrong answer, but you right. can learn what is important to them, what are yeah. their beliefs, what are they, what is their work ethic. Yeah. Exactly. You try to, in the end, you try to find that. Yeah. Which okay. is, you can't just come right out and say that or ask that. Right. Because they'd be like, great, it's phenomenal, best ever. <laughs> Don't look at the last three jobs that I, I stayed at I was going to say, we're going to do a trial period then. And like see yeah, it's yeah. tough. Yeah. It's very tough. Yeah. yeah. But I get, I mean, kudos to you for growing. That's, that's impressive. I feel, yeah, I feel confident in the sense of now I understand what it means to, to focus on team, you know, building a team. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are things, you know, that we aren't meant to get bogged down with. We've got to keep the no. momentum going, and mm -hmm. you know, thank goodness that it's possible to to create a team, and at the same time, yeah, it's just a growing growing pain season. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it is interesting. Yeah, you mentioned an opportunity there. Yeah, it is incredible. Yeah, because I think I can throw an ad online, mm -hmm. and in a day or two, I'll have hundreds of applicants. Yeah, majority are garbage. Yeah, but. I mean, if I were to do this before when there wasn't an internet, I got to right. go to the newspaper right. and wait a week for it to actually show up. Mm -hmm. And then people are going to call. And if I miss their call and all this like all the whole time. stuff, yeah. yeah, we wouldn't have the remote, no. uh, the Zoom meetings or whatever and stuff no. like that, good or bad. So no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> whatever. exactly. It's, it's, it's remarkable what yeah. we're able to do now. And I'm so grateful for it. And that is one of the reasons that taking the leap from corporate world was so enticing to pave my own way. Yeah. And and to see what's what's possible to not be told it's always been done with this way. Oh. My least favorite phrase. Fair. And <laughs> and <laughs> short of people saying I hate my voice, like that's that's something that I think is just so limiting. Yeah. And and so yes, the resources that we are privy to the capabilities is just astonishing to me, and it keeps me grateful. So that keeps me moving in the days that you just want to <laughs> yeah, well, lie just down like for a while. Yeah, just business, right? Any <laughs> yeah. business or any really relationship. Yeah. I mean, a business is a bunch it, of relationships, it is, right? Exactly. Your relationship with your business, your relationship with the people in your mm -hmm. business, and in whatever capacity. There absolutely. will be challenges. Yes. Right? Challenging days, challenging yes. moments. Exactly. And I always tell people nobody gets excited to go on a flat roller coaster. Yeah. So, exactly. I mean, just ex accept that these exactly. are kind of the, the hills and the screaming part with the curves upside down. Exactly. Yep. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Kind of. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are days. There can definitely day be days where you're like, I get to do this. Like, yeah. how amazing is that? Mm -hmm. And not everybody is, is cut out for it. And, and how does that phrase go? Like, entrepreneurship is self-growth on steroids. That's oh, I've never heard that yeah. before. Yeah, interesting. Self growth, self -growth on steroids. Self growth on steroids. All and right. I would uh, attest to that for sure. Yeah, we're and, right there. And I think that's that's worthwhile. And and it's okay that it's not for everybody too, because to our our you know pain point of teams, we need those supports. You Absolutely. know, we need those skills, and we yep. need people who are in that community with us. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Brandon, well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much, James. This is such how a can, pleasure. How can people find you? The easiest way is to find me at www.yourvocalvitality.com. They can also find me on Facebook, Your Vocal Vitality, LinkedIn, at Brian Hennessy. And email is the easiest, too. You'll find emails on all those sites. So nice. I look forward to hearing from you. And you can help people nationally. Yes, okay. correct. Correct. All right. Super cool. Yeah. That is really awesome. Amazing. I learned a lot here. I'm so glad. Yeah, my throat hurts a little. That's but <laughs> we'll do a cool down afterwards. Don't <laughs> worry. I'll help you out. It's Love all it. good. It. <laughs> this has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. We are locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie. If you could do us a huge favor and please that algorithm by giving it the big old <laughs> thumbs up, commenting, and of course, sharing it with all your entrepreneurial friends, as well as the people you know that probably talk a little too much, which I think <laughs> is just about everybody. But maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I never take the time to listen. <laughs> My name is James Kateman, and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering and reception services for service businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com, as well as the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur in all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. 
We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Brian Hennessy, the owner of Your Vocal Vitality. And Brian, can you tell us the website one more time? Yes, sir. www.yourvocalvitality.com. Easy enough. Super cool. Past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night. The podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. Thank you for listening. We will see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And if you do nothing else, enjoy your business. <laughs>